I know you don't want me to say anything at all, you just want to hear James sing again. But I am going to say something about Johanna Müller Hellmann, who is our final composer of these four sessions focusing on women composers this weekend. And before I launch into this bit of the talk, I should remind everybody that this work was initiated by mezzo soprano Kitty Waitley who sadly can't be with us with this weekend because our whole family has COVID. But I feel we have to remember that it was she who had this idea and who did so much of the legwork finding this repertoire and making all of this happen this weekend. So if you feel like supporting Katie's work by supporting Swapra, then please, I will put the details on the final slide and do so because that's what has made a lot of this weekend possible. Johanna müller hermann we are going to time travel back to Vienna about a hundred years ago, a little bit more than a hundred years ago. And what I want to do is start by asking what did people think women were capable of at that time? Um, I should remind everybody that these things were scientifically grounded, <laughs> whatever that means. And, you know, people measure skulls and can find the evidence that they wish to find to make all sorts of arguments. And one of the important figures in these arguments was a man called Otto Weininger, who some of you may have come across in his fabulously unreadable book, Geschlecht und Charakter, Gender and Character. Sigmund Freud also had a part to play in this, but we don't have enough hours to complain about Sigmund Freud's <laughs> legacy for gender. Weininger's work appeared in 1903, and instead of sinking into well-deserved oblivion, it was re reprinted 24 times between 1903 and 1924. So everybody in educated middle-class Vienna would have had a copy and would have gained their understanding of women from Weininger's thought. In a nutshell, what he argued was that the more intelligent a woman was, the manlier she was. Unmanly, don't laugh, this gets very sinister. Unmanly women were content and they didn't seek emancipation. It was they were happier as women than manly women. And his argument extended to say that famous and exceptional women displayed male characteristics which were visible even on their bodies. So intelligent women were physically manlier than unintelligent women. He also argued that maternal love was unquestioning and instinctive, without choice. Women had no choice but to love the children that they bore, and I would love to know what some of you are thinking about that one. And he also did, I think, a particular piece of damage when he argued that romantic love and sexual love should be disaggregated. If you loved your wife, you couldn't possibly disrespect her so much that you wanted to sleep with her. <laughs> If you needed sex, 
you went to a prostitute because that's what prostitutes were good for. And that separation has done untold damage across the 20th century in the way that women saw themselves and men saw themselves and people saw the relationship of marriage. But this is where, <laughs> this is the environment into which Johanna Müller Hermann was born. Now, picking up on something that Leah said in the earlier session, she was in many ways extremely blessed. She came from a successful middle-class family. Her father was one of the bazillion civil servants that the Austrian administration seemed to need at the time. Every second you could spit and hit a civil servant in Austria at the beginning of the 20th century. Um, he was ennobled because of the work that he did as a government official, so she became von Hermann, which is wonderful. He was very musical, and one thing which I liked in her memoir of him was that he himself taught his three children to dance as a social skill. And I thought, oh, that's very nice. He also ensured that they all got a musical education. And he made sure that they practiced as a trio of children. There were three of them regularly in the home, every evening, every Sunday. And they put on amateur theatricals. And it all sounds absolutely idyllic. She also had a lovely brother who she loved very, very much, Albert. Albert died in 1895 when he was just 31 years old. And that was a great tragedy of her life because he shared all of his cultural experiences, all of his musical education with her. He brought it home and gave her access to a great many things. Just reversing our narratives of gender tragedy for a moment, Albert wanted to be a conductor. And his father said no, he had to study law which is a story that will be familiar to those of you who know Robert Schumann. And exactly the same thing happened. Schumann was forced to study law, and we all know how well that particular venture went. Um, Albert tried, he qualified, he got a job, he caught a cold, and he died. And this was one of the tragedies of Johanna müller hermanns life. Father Müller Hermann then exercised his will a little bit further and said she must attend a teacher training institute, which is a relatively new invention at the time. Now, think about this for a moment. When I read that, I thought, what a good man. He wanted to ensure that his daughter would be financially independent. Doesn't that sound like a good thing? Educate her, train her, and let her be financially independent. She didn't want to go to this teacher training institution. And she married a man called Otto Müller Martini in 1893 because he would look after her and she wouldn't have to work and she could dedicate all her time to composition. That was an interesting one for me because I'm so used to telling myself that the working woman is the ideal woman. The woman who has choice, agency, and her own income is in a privileged position. But in fact, it is the opposite in this situation. It was marriage which freed up her time to do the things that she wanted to do. I'm going to come back to that marriage because there's something fishy there, but you know, we'll see. Uh, I don't want to anticipate the various shock and awe moments that I have in preparation for you. So after her marriage, she could go to the university. She could study orchestration. She could study composition and theory and all sorts of things. 15 years later, she was a professor of music theory at the new Vienna Conservatory. A huge achievement at the time. And she held that job for 14 years. So she knew what she was doing. So far, so good. Her music was performed continuously over 51 years. There is an enormous trace of her musical life across the Viennese press and beyond, from 1904 to 1955. So that's, I think, quite a lot. She died in mysterious circumstances in 1941. And I was looking at the death certificate this morning, and it genuinely is mysterious circumstances. It just says she's died. But actually, there's someone in this room who knows a great deal about this more than I do, who I might ask later if the moment presents itself. She left her papers to her husband and her sister, who was a very musical person, Torna. She was a singer. The sister and the nephew, the sister and the sister's son, had the right to decide what music might be published. But then, tragedy struck. 
Mr. Muller Martini, her husband, who had been married to her for 48 years, remarried with unseemly haste, I think, immediately, a woman called Leopoldine Schwamel. Now, who knows what was going on there, but he married her, and then he immediately died. <laughs> leaving his first wife's music to his second wife, which I think was so unstrategic, you couldn't make it up. The second wife gave half of it to, bear with me, gave half of it to the aunt and the nephew and kept the other half and kept 75% of the copyright profits for herself until her death. But I wonder what it would have been like to have been Leopoldine Schwamel, about whom I could find out almost nothing, to be that second wife who is taking on a mantle after 48 years of the famous and successful first wife. I'm not sure I would have made great efforts to promote the music of said first wife. I think I might have lost the pieces in a cupboard <laughs> or put them in the attic and had a good sulk, which is what I suspect what happened. So we have an entanglement here of what we might call public or social factors, understandings of what women are capable of. And then we have this mystery within the actual home of the Muller Martinis, and we don't know quite a lot of what happened there. I can't find anything detailed in the obituaries. You know what obituaries are like. They tend to be very polite. So we don't really know what happened there. What I want to do now is hand over to Leah to focus back out again and think about gender and Viennese modernism for a bit before we return to some music. Yeah, it's, I, I love that you mentioned Beininger. His, he has a wonderful quote, uh, which I particularly love, which is, uh, in women, the longer the hair, the smaller the brain. And I sit there <laughs> with my very long hair, and uh, every time I, I sort of teach on this topic with my students, we, we have a discussion about the longer the hair, the smaller the brain. They will sort of sit there and be like, who's going to say? Who's going to point out that his hair is really long? <laughs> but yeah, so I mean, this is, as you say, a really problematic context for Johanna Müller-Hermann. Uh, and I think it's quite difficult to not have those things sink in to your kind of perception of self, um, if that's what everybody believes. Having said that, I think we also need to balance that even at the time that Feininger is writing this odious material, um, there are women who kick back against it and say, actually, no, <laughs> this, is, this is not right, um, and who sort of voice a sort of significant amount of protest, and there are successful women. Um, and I think uh, Muller Herman is a really interesting example because she's, she's part of these women who were, these group of women who were incredibly successful in their lifetimes and have since been written out. Um, it's not that the press weren't paying attention to her in her day. It's not that her music wasn't being performed. There's something that's happened since then. Um, and particularly with this, we, we have to bear in mind that we're looking at Vienna. Uh, she dies in 1941 middle of the Second World War, and you know, the new Vienna Conservatory that she taught at was an extremely progressive uh, music institution. They had classes on cabaret. Um, this does not go down extremely well um, under uh, the Nazi regime. And so with these contexts, we've got, you know, we've got the usual issues around women's music being destroyed. Uh, we also have now have to think about issues of documentation being deliberately or accidentally destroyed because of war. Um, and because of political circumstances completely beyond this woman's control um, that have shaped her reception since. Um, but Vienna is, particularly for music, so important because it's sort of considered the birth of modernism. Um, and particular figures have kind of risen to the top within that narrative. Um, Schoenberg, Berg, Webern, obviously are sort of the kings of Viennese modernism. And even then, uh, Miller Hammond's teacher, Zemlinsky, is less well known now simply because of the, t the sort of style that he wrote in. And as you can hear with the Miller Hammond, she doesn't sound like Schoenberg. She doesn't sound like um, she's not using serialism. And so we've got this really interesting clash of uh, factors completely beyond her control that is shaping who's remembered and who isn't after their death. 
And partly, you know, Schoenberg writes himself into history. He's a theorist as much as he is a composer. We have all these books by him going, this is the progression from Bach, Beethoven, Brahms, me. <laughs> um, and, you know, if you're not writing like that, um, it, and he has, you know, theorists who come after him who promote his style. And so that's why we kind of have this narrative now that writes out a huge amount of what was actually happening at Vienna in Vienna at the time. Schoenberg's rise was not uncontested. Yes, he was extremely famous, but there's so much going on that we, we just know so very little about. Um, and it's not because there isn't documentation. Um, and I, I guess now we're able to sort of look more broadly and sort of go, okay, modernism is now historical. <laughs> We're less sort of in that moment of going, okay, we are creating um, narratives about what modernism is. Now we can kind of look back a bit more and go, okay, what's what's in the, like, sort of left behind by this very dominant narrative about the sort of progress of music throughout the early 20th century in Vienna? Um, and then we find figures like Joanna and we can kind of go, okay, we have a much, much more complicated and exciting story in some way here, some ways here, because it isn't as sort of linear um, as is sometimes sort of given the impression of with the uh, rise and dominance of atonality and that mm. school. So I think that for me is, you know, there are, it's it's cl not, it's clearly not quite true that Viennese music and Viennese modernism was masculine. Um, we're now sort of in, in, in art history as well. We find out about uh, the women who sort of <laughs> were, were blocked from the art academies and go, okay, well, we're going to set up our own school. Thank you very much. <laughs> and they, do, they exhibit themselves. And it's clearly there are narratives about masculinity and femininity that are always being resisted. And that is fascinating to see how these women had agency, how they said, actually, no, these narratives about us are not true. Um, so that, I think, is what really fascinates me here, is that we have a woman who is in the midst of these very, very sort of conflicted, polarized. Yeah, yeah, very polarised society, um, succeeding mm. and proving <laughs> through demonstration that Weiniger's not, <laughs> not I was, I was going to say something very rude there, but not correct. <laughs> let's, go, let's go with that. Yeah, well, I think the less of Weininger, the better, probably, yeah. but still. <laughs> what we're going to do now is have a stretch of music. Mm -hmm. Uh, we're going to use Strauss again as musical wallpaper. Although when I say musical wallpaper, I think of the kind of wallpaper which is really quite prominent in a room. So uh, we're going to follow Strauss with two songs of Müller Hermann. So a good stretch. And I hope you're going to... I have really fallen in love with these songs. I think of a lot of songs that I've had to work through um, over the last weeks in preparation for these days. I think these are the ones which are really staying with me. But anyway, I won't anticipate too much. Over to James and Anna. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
Yeah, okay, so I think, <laughs> so it's, um, sorry, I've sort of, sorry, got completely carried away listening there. Um, but yeah, so when we were sort of thinking about, okay, well, how can we contextualise uh, Johan Mola Hermann? Um, we were thinking about Rebecca Clark and Ethel Smythe, who are contemporaneous with her, and what kind of comparisons we might be able to draw, especially because uh, Ethel Smythe is a very well-known name, or was a very well-known name in Germany, and so... While uh, Johanna Muller Hermann was working, um, I, so Smythe goes over to, so her music gets performed with Mahler's for the posthumous world premiere of Das Lied von der Erde. And at the time, Ethel Smythe was heavily involved with the suffrage movement in the UK. And she writes back to Emmeline Panker saying that, well, she's gone over to, to see her music performed, but. Um, well, she, she, she had to stop in at the dentist and so she left all these suffrage pamphlets in the waiting room because she was so sick of German and Austrian attitudes towards women's suffrage that she hoped that she could uh, convince a few unsuspecting people by leaving these pamphlets around in unexpected places. So I quite like the idea of her sort of just trotting around, leaving pamphlets. Um, but so I, I think there, is, there are a number of uh, issues that sort of come up if we start to think about these um, women in kind of comparable contexts and in terms of how we think about what happens to them after they die. Because, again, Ethel Smythe is one of these figures who was extraordinarily famous during her lifetime. She has she wrote herself wrote ten books, many of which were autobiographies, and even the ones that are supposedly not autobiographies are really about her. <laughs> um, I've never... She, she wrote a biography of Beecham to Sir Thomas Beecham, of which half, she says, explicitly is about her. And the first half is like, I don't know Beecham very well, but let me tell you some anecdotes in which I feature heavily. It's a great biography. Um, but... Uh, so she's incredibly famous. And then we have the importance of the press for her which is, so where you were saying that the obituaries don't really, they're, they're quite polite, they don't really say much about Johanna Muller Hermann. Um, in Ethel Smythe's case, that is not true. So every single newspaper carries an obituary of Ethel Smythe because she's a very famous woman by the time she dies. You know, she's got honorary doctorates coming out of her ears, she's a dame. Um, but they say, oh, she's what an eccentric character, she's a good writer. It's a shame she spent so much time fighting for women's rights, otherwise she could have been a good composer. But she should have known better than to waste her time on politics and should have spent more time composing. And so immediately when she dies, the newspapers write her out and she sort of gets written out the narrative. And I think that's really pervasive because you can trace this through right the way until, you know, Odalinda La Martinez is conducting her work at the proms, Ethel Smith's work at the proms in the 1990s, 
And the reviewers go, oh, I'm not expecting much. We all know Ethel Smythe. She was an eccentric lesbian, but she's not a good composer. One, she wasn't a lesbian. <laughs> Let me correct that right there. I think if we're going to apply a modern term, uh, I think queer is much better than lesbian because, you know, one of her most significant relationships in her life was with a man. Um, and, you know, it's very, she never labeled her own sexuality. It was clearly, she says, you know, she calls it herself. Her sexuality is an everlasting puzzle. And that was her. Uh, sort of take on her sexuality but these stereotypes persist and they're circulated uh, by the media and it's a real shame because you know it's for me writing a biography of her I was looking at her diaries and the utterly heartbreaking thing for me is that so towards the end of her life she goes deaf and she can't really she really struggles with her composition uh, she becomes very unwell as well on top of that and so she's that's one of the reasons why she turns to writing so heavily and in her diary she confesses she says well one of the reasons I want to write so much is because I'm terrified of dying not because of what comes after but because I'm scared that I've had to fight so hard for my music I'm terrified that when I die I can't control my legacy anymore who will be left to fight for me and to read that in her diary and then see the day she dies the day she's no longer there saying hang on you're wrong uh, the press do exactly what she was so scared of. And that was a really heartbreaking thing to, to read and then have to sort of write um, her life and say, well, actually everything she was scared of happened <laughs> um, after she died. So we, I, think, I, th I think definitely here, this sort of thinking about, okay, well, we've got this situation in uh, Austria where we've got to think about sources, but also about the, the power of the media to not talk about people or to really shape the way that we do talk about people. Um, and then with Rebecca Clark, so she's another one who, by the time she, she's, she's in sort of slightly different case, because again, extremely famous um, in her own lifetime, and then sort of vanishes towards the end of her life to the point where the English newspapers don't carry obituaries of her that I found. Um, if anybody has found an obituary in an English newspaper, please send it my way. Um, but she's moved to America by the time she dies, and so there is an obituary of her, very, very short one, um, in some of the American newspapers that's arranged by her family. But, again, <laughs> why is she not being mentioned? And so she sort of gets rediscovered, almost, in the uh, 90s, 1970s, 80s, 90s. But it's this process, again, of rediscover of, of people, of performers, coming on and saying, actually, okay, we need to play this music because this music is fantastic. Um, so I guess that's one of the things that I think we should sort of think about is, one, the power that the media have to sort of determine who does and does not make it into our stories and what performers can do to disrupt that. Um, but also composers who come after them. So where we were talking about Schoenberg before, so with Ethel Smythe, and uh, Rebecca Clark, Benjamin Britten, they had the misfortune to be working before Benjamin Britten. And so Benjamin Britten, again, a writer as well as a, as a composer, and he comes along and he says, I am England's first opera composer since Henry Purcell. Well, hang on. <laughs> Ethel Smythe wrote six operas, and everybody knew that these operas were there. Her opera, The Wreckers, got performed at Sadler's Wells. Um, in 1939, just a few years before Peter Grimes gets premiered. So there's a cultural memory loss between the, in this six year period where this woman who fought so hard for opera in, in England, she's one of the, so, you know, people, she, she is one of the early figures campaigning for nationally subsidized opera. She's, in, she's too early for her time, and it's actually Benjamin Britten who eventually is going to benefit from that, where he comes along, and by that time, the Arts Council's sort of, in its first stages, it's his opera company that um, succeeds as a result. And also, then we see what he's, he's telling this narrative about himself as a composer in the way that Schoenberg does, and it gets picked up, and a few people write into the newspapers and say, you've just bought this narrative that Benjamin Britten's peddling. What are you doing? I remember going to see Ethel Smythe. I remember seeing Stanford's operas. What are you doing? But it's such a compelling narrative, and I think they're in the right place at the right time. We have these historical moments that sort of sweep away the nuance and the, and the sort of the, 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 the messy bits, if you like, that um, don't quite fit into a very neat linear line. Um, 
So those are the those are two things that um, I think are comparable. Mm. Are how composers and how newspapers shaped by a mission or shaped by telling stories about themselves that don't include these women. We're going to pick up on that and mm. show you a couple of examples of how powerful this can be. Um, I want to continue with this idea of comparison. When people think about Johanna Müller Hermann, one of the first people they think of as a reference point for her is Alma Mahler, whose songs have been frequently recorded and performed, certainly for a woman composer, if I can put it that way. She is well known. And this picks up on something that I was talking about yesterday afternoon, which is that she had the ultimate famous man. She had a whole string of famous men in her life. Uh, I don't want to dwell too much on Alma Mahler, except for this, which I thought might shock you. This is from the website of one of Britain's fairly reputable music critics who shall go nameless on this occasion, but you're more than welcome to Google. And this is from something that was published on that person's website in 2014, talking about Vienna and gender, in which he has a label, Johanna Müller Hermann, but the sharp-eyed amongst you will say, hang on a minute, that's this woman. Alma Mahler. This is not Johanna Müller Hermann that he has shown. So this is just eight years ago. I suppose I look at these things because I would love to believe that as a society we are getting smarter and we are not falling into the Weininger idiocy traps. Of course, Leah and I, being terribly masculine normally, were shaving our legs wildly before we came <laughs> onto this stage. But this is a recent, of course. Um, I also put my hair up not to offend the Weininger fans in the room. <laughs> this is a recent problem. This enraged me when I found it this morning. And I promised myself when I was drafting these talks that I would not present you with my rage. <laughs> However, I then read the review that this person writes, which I'm afraid I am going to put you through the whole thing. The music we heard, this professional music critic working to this day in this country says, a pair of Opus 3 piano pieces played by Oliver Davies was in its third hand Chopin way, rather less interesting than Müller Hermann's story though early salon pieces may not accurately reflect the merit of an output. No shit, says Natasha. 37 opus numbers strong, including orchestral music that was, according to Zushi, promoted by Wilhelm Furtwängler, though I can't find any rec record of him actually conducting her music. For now, we'll just have to wonder whether her Whitman settings in memoriam bear comparison with those of Delius, Vaughan Williams, or Copeland. The Opus 2 heroic overture has just the kind of backward-facing grandeur Fort Wengler tended to fall upon gratefully, even as he was privately wringing his hands over the felt obligation to do his best by Schoenberg. An Opus 6 quartet, you can hear it here, shows Zemlinsky's influence more positively, even if it's hard to hear a personal voice, seeing through all that carefully crafted chromatic counterpoint. This is where we are now, not a hundred years ago. And I really hope I'm not the only person in the room who's quite cross at reading that. That person did not attend their unconscious bias training at work, <laughs> I think. So it gets worse. Yes, it is a urinal, and you will recognize this urinal because it is Duchamp's urinal, is it not? Duchamp's fountain, I hope this is an iconic work for you. Now, you may say, I know this because I read this article in The Guardian in 2019, which is that Duchamp did not make that piece of art. He did not, good people. <laughs> Evidence suggests that the famous urinal fountain attributed to Marcel Duchamp was actually created by Baroness Elsa von Freitag, Freitag Loringhoven. Why haven't we heard of her? asks Siri Hustved, who many of you will know is the wife 
of the novelist Paul Auster and an extremely fine writer in her own regard. So, the story goes, she says, Marcel Duchamp, brilliant inventor of the ready-made and anti-retinal art, submitted fountain, a urinal signed R. Mutt, to the American Society of Independent Artists in 1917. In 2004, it was voted the most influential modern artwork of all time. Duchamp said he had purchased the urinal from J.L. Mott Iron Works Company, adapting Mutt from Mott, but the company didn't manufacture the model in the photograph. His story cannot be true. The article is fairly long, but I stopped there because I thought this, this is our responsibility now. We can't blame history for this particular mess. The museums, including the Tate, have not budged on this story. And you're more than welcome to Google this artwork or look at museum catalog labels. The standard fountain narrative with Duchamp as hero goes on. I am convinced, says Hustvedt, that if the urinal had been attributed to the Baroness from the beginning, it would never have soared into the stratosphere as a work of consumer genius. Women are rarely granted such status. But the present reputation of Fountain, one that was hardly instantaneous, but grew slowly over the course of many decades, has made the truth embarrassing, not to speak of the money involved and the urgent need to rewrite history. The evidence is there. They can't or won't see it. Why, she asks. When I went to a conference in Oslo three years ago, my last pre-COVID conference, and I was talking about how women's art is evaluated and how we are the owners of that evaluation. We need an understanding of ourselves before we can talk about anyone else's art. And I then presented this example and somebody in the, in the room piped up and said, well, I never thought it was a very good piece of art anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Which was one of those, I, I was actually speechless for the first and last time in my life. I thought, ah, that, that tells me a great deal about that person. So I present this really as a closing provocation to all of us. I mean, I have been so moved really by the excellent turnout for these four sessions over the weekend and I hope that we've entertained you but also given you a great deal to think about apart from um, hopefully presenting you with lots of songs that you would like to hear again. We should, we will leave the last word to one of our women composers. This is a fuzzy picture of Johanna Müller-Hermann. So I should thank all of my co well, my co-presenter Leah Broad and our wonderful musicians, James Atkinson and Anna Tilbrook for all of the contributions you've made to this afternoon session. And we will finish by hearing the three songs of Müller Hermann that you've heard today. Herbst, Die stille Stadt and Wie eine Vollmondnacht.
Thank you, everyone. I hope you've enjoyed it. Have a wonderful rest of your weekend. Hope you enjoy the evening concert. And I think we're going to hang around for a little bit, aren't we? People want to tell us what they thought. Thank you.